Today I want to share with you, the title of today's sermon is called, Is There an Easy Way? Is there an easy way? And I think that's a question that oftentimes we ask in anything that we do, in everything that we do. Is there an easy way? You know, whether at school, at work, in relationship, is there an easy way? Today we're going to read from Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 through 11. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 through 11. If you do not have your Bible, the verses are on the overhead. And let's read it together in one voice. I'll try to read it slowly. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 through 11. Let's begin. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For forty days and forty nights he fasted and became very hungry. During that time the devil came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell those stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, No, the scriptures say, People do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, If you are the Son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say, He will order His angels to protect you, and they will hold you up with their hands, so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus responded, The scriptures also say, You must not test the Lord your God. Next the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give it all to you, he said, if you will kneel and down, kneel down and worship me. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him. For the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil went away and angels came and took care of him. You know, I love to say that I was a good student, I was smart, and I made good grades all throughout my school years. But if I were to say that, I would be lying because I was not really a, a great student. I wasn't a terrible student, but I don't, I don't consider myself a great student. Uh, I remember when I was young, uh, I, it wasn't too bad. I made A's and B's mostly, but you know, I, like most young people, I hated study. I didn't enjoy reading textbooks. I didn't enjoy going to school. In fact, when I went to school, you know, like most kids, I would like to pass notes. I like to scribble, draw pictures and stuff like that. And, and I didn't want to pay attention to teachers. And, you know, I like to daydream a lot. And, but, you know, like, but at the same time, I wanted to make good grades. At the same time, I wanted to make A's. And, and whenever during report card time came and, you know, all the smart kids, you know, they would always go around asking people, so what did you get on your report card? You know, and the reason why they ask, because they want to show you their grades. And, you know, I wanted to do that too. But somehow, you know, I, I just didn't want to go through all the trouble of studying and reading and listening and paying attention and all of those things. And then one day, I turned on the television and I saw this infomercial. Infomercial is a, is a commercial, but it's not like 30 second commercial. It's like a you know, 30 minute commercial. They call it infomercial. Anyway, um, the infomercial was called Where There Is a Will, There Is a A. Usually there's a saying, Where There's a Will, There Is a Way, but this title was Where There's a Will, There Is an A. And it was developed by this professor only. And according to the infomercial, he says, He has discovered a secret. Secret for students, for every student, if they follow these instructions, that they, every one of them, can make an A. That if, if you follow this, if you buy this video, and if you follow the instructions, you can make an A, and you can go to a nice college. And my sister and I, my older sister, she's about four years older, I'm, I'm like, you know, I'm like 11 years old, my sister's, what, uh, 15 years old, and we watched this video together, and we looked at each other, and we said, we got to get this video. We got to get this video. So it was 20 bucks, so we chipped in money together and we decided we ordered this video. And finally, about a week later, the video package came and we opened it and there was this you know, video cassette. And we opened it and we, you know, we put it in the VCR and we pressed the you know, play button 
And as the video came, my sister and I, we sat in, you know, kneeled and leaned forward, you know, excitedly anticipating uh, what this video will tell us. The secret to making an A. So we watched this 30 minute video. Actually, it was a two hour video, and we fast forwarded all the things, and we watched the basic instructions of it. And to our dismay, to our sadness, this is what the video said. The video said that if you want to make an A, the keys are, when you go to class, sit in the front. If you want to make an A, it says, you must take good notes. If you want to make an A, you must read your books, underline, put check marks, and try to read it at least five times, and then maybe twice just before the test. If you want to make an A, you want to make sure that you sit in the front and you pay attention. And all the things that this video told us that we need to do to make an A was all the things that my sister and I didn't want to do and make an A. From this video, my sister and I, we learned a valuable lesson. And the lesson was that in life, that there's no such thing as a shortcut. But in our lives, in everything that we do, we pursue and we seek after shortcuts. We want to achieve things without putting in too much work. We want to attain things without waiting for it. We want, to, we want success without investing in it. And that is really the basic nature of all of us. We want a shortcut. But the question that I want to ask you, is it, is it, is it really a shortcut? And is there a shortcut? And that question is answered in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 through 11. The verse that we just read. It's the story about Jesus. After Jesus was born and lived for about 30 years, according to this passage, it says God anointed him. God blessed him. What that means is that it was at that time he was filled with God's Spirit. It doesn't say it specifically, but it's a very good guess that God probably told Jesus, probably showed him, showed him his purpose, his mission, and his goal. When, when Jesus received this mission from God, it tells us that Jesus decided to fast for 40 days and 40 nights. The word fast means to abstain from food. Abstain from food. Bible teaches us, that, you know, in the, also the history tells us, that oftentimes people fasted, abstained from food, whenever they had to make an important decision in their lives. And they just wanted to really devote themselves just to pray. In, a, in culturally back then, you know, when you had to eat, eating actually took up a lot of time. And unlike us, we can actually cook a meal in like three minutes. All we have to do is put things in a microwave and press a button. But in the old days, whenever they had to cook, cooking actually took about two hours, gathering the wood, burning the wood, and then cooking and setting. It actually took two hours. So in, the, in, the, in those times of Jesus, whenever people really wanted to pray about something very, very important, they chose to abstain from food and devote themselves strictly to prayer. And Bible also tells us that people fasted from food because Bible tells us that when our flesh is weak, our spirit becomes strong. Now, it may sound like a mystery, but if you experience it, it is very true. When our flesh is strong, when our body is strong, we don't rely on flesh and we don't rely on the spirit. But those of us, when our flesh is weak, when our body is weak, we tend to be more focused in our mentally, emotionally, and so forth. So in those days, whenever people had something to really important to pray about, they would abstain from food, and they would fast, and they would pray. So when Jesus probably received this, this mission from God, He understood how important it was. So He decided to take 40 days and abstain from eating from 40 days to pray. But during those 40 days, something very interesting happened. He says, during those 40 days, Satan came to him. And Satan tempted him. Satan tempted him in three ways. First way that Satan tempted him was this. Satan said, hey, you know, after a few days, you know, Jesus was probably hungry. And Satan said, hey, why are you uh, making things so hard? You know? I know that cooking is hard and, and so forth and you have to eat and so, you know, I know that. But hey, why do you have to make it so hard on yourself? And Satan said, Jesus, I know that you have the power 
to do this. Why don't you simply command the stones to become bread? You can do it. Now, you don't have to go through this hardship. See, I don't know about you. I'm, I'm sure many of you. I've fasted, and I'm, it's kind of a little, I don't, I don't want to say embarrassing, but it's nothing to boast about because as a pastor, you know, it's not a long length of time. But the longest that I've fasted was two and a half days. Two and a half days. And when I fasted for two and a half days, the hardest time is the first day and a half. <laughs> because the first day and a half, you go through this extreme hunger pain. I mean, you feel pain from hunger. You know, but first day, physically, you're fine, you know. But then, like the second day, and the third day, I mean, everything becomes delicious. <laughs> everything looks tasty. I remember one time I was at this prayer mountain. It's a place where people go to fast and pray. And I was in this little, you know, uh, trailer, and that's where I slept, and that's where I read the book, and I prayed, and so forth. And, and they had a refrigerator where, you know, you keep your water because Texas was very hot. And whenever I opened the refrigerator, I don't know who did it, but somebody left a half-eaten pack of M&Ms. And normally, I tell you, I'm not, I don't eat, I like chocolate, but I'm not really into chocolate. But the, the second day and the third day, all I could dream about was those M&Ms. And it, oh, it looked so tasty, you know, and, uh, and so forth. And I remember the third day. Whenever I got up, I would pray, and I would pray, and I wanted to get up. And beginning the third day, whenever I got up, I started getting lightheaded. And normally, you know, I would walk, you know, fast from trailer to trailer, trailer to chapel. But, you know, after fasting for two days and going on my third day, it was very difficult for me to run really fast. I would get exhausted. I had no energy. Jesus, after fasting, I don't know for how many days, he was probably extremely hungry, physically very weak. And I'm sure... As a, as a man, he was hungry and he wanted to eat. And when, Jesus, when Satan came to him and said, why don't you turn this stone into bread? I'm sure Jesus was tempted to take the easy way out. But Jesus said, no. Man does not live by bread alone. That means just you know, meeting our physical need. That's not the most important thing. But learning and meditating on the Word of God, that is what is important. So Satan tempted Jesus to take the easy way out. But Jesus said, no, I will not take the easy way out. And the second way that Satan tempted Jesus was, Satan tempted Jesus to test God. He says, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and nights he fasted and became hungry. I'm sorry. Verse 5, then the devil took him to the holy city Jerusalem to the highest point of the temple and said if you are the son of God jump off for the scripture says he will order his angels to protect you basically this is what devil said hey I know things are hard but you know you know surely God's not gonna God God is a good God he's gonna protect you he's not gonna let anything bad happen to you right so you don't have to really worry about protecting yourself, and you don't have to go through all, all this hardship. Try it. Test God. God's not going to let you suffer. God's not going to you know, let you die. You, know, you don't have to do it. God's going to watch over you. What Satan is basically telling Jesus to do is, hey, take God for granted. Don't worry about it. He's a good God. God is a God of grace. He's gonna, not going to let anything happen to you. Just test Him. Try Him out. And oftentimes, Satan does that to us too. Why don't you test God? Hey, I know right now, oh man, you know, there's, there's certain things on the internet that I shouldn't be watching. But you know, Satan goes, you know, you know what, just do it once. God is a good God. God is a wonderful God. Just because you watch that thing on the internet once, God's not going to destroy you. God's not going to kill you. Because it's a good God. See, what Satan is doing is tempting us to test God. If you want to break the law, it's like, oh, don't worry about it. You know, if you break this law, you know, I know it's a bad thing, but you know, God is a good God. Just do it once. It's okay. And this was what was happening to Jesus. Satan said, why don't you test God? 
No, you're going through all this hardship. Just test him. I'm sure God's going to comfort you. Even if you break away from what God told you to do, I'm sure God will protect you. But our job is not to test God. Our job has always been to simply obey God. And the third way in which Satan tempted Jesus was to, to take a shortcut. Not just the easy way, but the shortcut. Don't even go through it. Take the shortcut. The shortcut in his mission, his purpose, and goal. In verse 8 it says, The next devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. He says, I will give it all to you, the devil said, if you kneel down and worship me. You know, why did Jesus come to earth? The Bible made it, made it very clear. Jesus came to be King of kings and Lord of lords. He came to rule, not like with authority, but as a servant ruler. He came to save the world. He came to be our king so that he can save us. And this is what the devil said. You know what? Jesus, you don't have to go through all this hardship. You don't have to go through the suffering. You don't have to go through people mocking you. You don't have to go through people, you're, you know, having people hurt you. You don't have to go through people spitting at you, cursing at you. You don't have to go through the path of Dolorosa, where you walk down the ways of sorrow with a cross on your back. You don't have to work, go through people whipping you. You don't have to go through that pain of being nailed to the cross. You don't have to, you don't have to go through any of that. All you have to do is bow down to me. I will give all of these, all this kingdom to you. If you simply bow down to me, I will make the, all the world, all the kingdoms bow down to you. What Satan was doing was tempting Jesus to take the shortcut. You don't have to go through all these things. I will give you what you want. Just follow this shortcut. And Jesus responded by saying, you, will, you shall worship the Lord your God and worship Him only. There's a great lesson to be learned here. And that is in that in our walk with God, there's only but one way. God's way. And the biggest mistake that we can make in life is when we choose a different path. An easy way a shortcut, testing God. I want to share with you today in how some of us, certain areas in which we take a shortcut. But I want to share with you that there are certain things in life. They are shortcuts, I guarantee you. They are shortcuts. In life, there's a shortcut in, in, uh, in driving. There's shortcuts. You can take, uh, whenever you go through the toll road, if you buy a, what do you call it, high pass, something like that, easy tag, you don't have to stop and pay the money. You can just drive through. That is a shortcut. There's shortcuts to you know, getting ready for you know, the next day. You don't have to take 30 minute shower. You can take a 10-minute you know, shower. You know, I, you know, I mean, there are many ways to make things shorter. But there are certain things in life where there's absolutely, there is no shortcut. And today I want to share with you three areas in which where there are no shortcuts. Number one, there is no shortcut and there is no easy way when it comes to leading people to Jesus Christ. And number two, there is no shortcut and there is no easy way when it comes to raising children. And number three, there is no shortcut and there is no easy way when it comes to building God's church. And the greatest danger that we can face in life is when we try to figure out a shortcut, an easy way, or a quick fix to these areas. First of all, there is no shortcut to leading people to Christ. My church back home, before I came to All Nations Community Fellowship, they did a survey and they discovered that 
sharing with people about Jesus Christ, leading people who do not know God to come to church, it take, they say it takes about two years. Two years. From the moment that we talk to them about Jesus Christ, of course, they're not going to come just because we ask them. You, ask, you have to ask them over and over and over again. You have to do so many things. You have to love them. You have to encourage them. They say it takes two years from the moment you make contact with a person who do not know God and to bring them to church and introduce them to God. Two years. It takes two years of serving, sharing, loving, being patient, and never giving up for people to get to know God. You know, my mother, you know, she's a really a wonderful woman of God. I mean, she loves God so much. And her greatest passion in life is to lead people to the loving God. And I remember one day she was telling me this story. I was home visiting, and she goes like, oh, I have to go to the hair salon. I'm like, really? Why? You know, I thought, are you going to get a haircut, mom? Or are you going to get a perm? You know, why are you going to a salon? He goes like, oh, I have to go and talk to someone. I'm like, why are you going to a hair salon to talk, go talk to someone? And then she went on to explain that, you know, a while ago, a few months ago, she went to this place called, uh, the haircutting place is called Tabong. Tabong. Tabong, that means very good? I don't know. It's called Tabong in Houston. And uh, she said she went there to get a haircut. And like she always does, she would ask the person that's cutting her hair, you know, do you go to church? Do you know God? And to her dismay, this lady was new, and she said, no, I don't, I'm new here, I don't know, I don't go to church, and I'm not a Christian. And that was like a, a, a trigger for my mom, and she began to invite her to church, but she would say, you know, uh, okay, I'll try, but I'm busy because I work all week, and, and I'm tired, and I don't want to go to church. Well, you know, my mom, you cannot just, you know, only way for my mom to talk to her about God was for her to be sitting there on the chair while she's cutting her hair. And you can't just, you know, stay there while she's working and try to talk to her about God. So the only way, only chance that she has to talk to this lady about God was for her to keep on going back and talking to her. And she said that normally she would go to the hair salon maybe once a month if she wanted to trim, and maybe once every two months. But in order to talk to her about God, she said she would go to Tabong once every two weeks. And she says she was doing that for three months, four months, and she says, I think it's working after about four months. Now, I don't know how much women's haircut costs in, in America, actually, but I'm thinking it's not cheap, maybe 20 bucks. But she would go there every other week, spend money, get haircut. After rejection, after rejection, after rejection, she would continue to go until finally she said, I found out later after six months, she said yes, and she came to church. And a few months after that, she became part of a house church, family group for us. Uh, of all places, my sister's family group. And she became a regular church member. Let me share another story of a wonderful lady that I know back home, uh, you know, where I grew up in Houston. And this lady is known. She probably led about, I don't know, about close to 60 people to God. And she said, and she shared this story with us one day. She said, one day she was walking outside of our apartment complex. And she saw this young lady with a little baby stroller. And she approached him and says, oh, are you Korean? She says, yes, I am. He says, are you new here? Because I haven't seen you around. He says, yes, I am new here. We just recently moved uh, from uh, Korea. And uh, we don't know any relatives. We don't have any. After she found out, she didn't know any, have any friends and relatives. And she was like, really? And she invited her to her house for dinner. And that night she came, and you know, in Korea it's easy to eat Korean food, but when you move to America, it is not easy to eat Korean food, just like you, you know, people from overseas, it's not easy. And when she invited her, her and, and her husband later that night, she cooked a feast for them to eat, a feast of Korean food, and they enjoyed it, they loved it. And then she invited them again about three, four more times. And then slowly she said, you know, uh, we go to this church, do you go to church? She says, no, we don't. Uh, we're not Christians. Says, really, do you want to come visit us? But she says, well, but she made an excuse. Well, we're a little busy. The kids are, sometimes kids are sick. And, and she would constantly turn, you know, turn her down. And after about four months, 
And these are, these are the words that came from that young couple that said, you know, this lady did this, you know, kept feeding us for four months. And after four months, when she, you know, kept on inviting us to church, there's no way we felt so guilty because she was so nice to us. She would help babysit sometimes. Sometimes when our baby was sick, she would help us take them to the hospital. She gave us so much love and she did so much for us. It was so hard for us to refuse. So after four months, we decided to accept her invitation to church. And they said it was one of the biggest and the best decisions that they ever made because they simply fell in love with church. And after a while, they said they fell in love with God. And, this, and they shared as a testimony because after a few months, they gave their life to Jesus Christ and they said they've never been happier. It took so much work for this lady to lead this person to God. And just to share my story, when I was in college, I came to know God when I was 21. And one day I was in a, our school club. I belonged to this club. And this guy, his name was Yong. He came to this place. And I've seen him before, but we never really talked. And I remember, you know, I, I kind of, you know, I don't want to pressure people, but I would always gently invite people, hey, do you go to church? And he's like, no. Really? Um, you know, we have, uh, we're, you know, we play basketball after church. And, uh, you know, why don't you come? And this guy was really a nice guy. Very polite, very nice. But he always gently say, oh, you know, that sounds great, but, you know, I, I, you know, I'll go, you know, I'm really busy right now, but when I have time, I will go. And I don't see him often, but I would see him maybe once a week, maybe, you know, twice and once every two weeks. And, but every time I see him, I would always say, you know, hey, Yong, what about this week? You know, do you have time? He's like, oh, Paul, you know, I'm busy, but next time when I have time, you know, I'll, I'll be sure to go with you. And he did that for about the first four times that we met. And he turned me down. But, you know, I was not really offended. There's no reason to be offended. But I just kept on. But after about four times, it happened in the span of two months, I said, you know, finally, you know, when I asked him, he finally said, okay, I'll come visit. I'll come visit your church this Sunday. I'm like, really? Wonderful. And I'll wait for you. You know, back then, everyone drives and so forth. I didn't have to go pick him up. And he said, okay, I I'll, I'll gave him directions. And okay, he knew where it was. And he said, he'll come. So that following Sunday, I went to church. And I was so excited. Oh, he's going to come. And I waited. And I waited. And I waited. And he didn't come. You know? So I went back. And uh, back, oh, by the way, back then, not everyone had cell phones. So I couldn't just call him. This was almost 20 years ago. <laughs> And so when I saw him at school again, I said, you know, hey, Yong, what happened? He's like, oh, Paul, I'm sorry, you know. Oh, it just became so busy. And I said, oh, really? What about this week then? He says, okay, I'll be sure to come again this week. I said, okay. So I went to church, and I waited. And I waited. And I waited. And he stood me up again. He didn't come. And I saw him again maybe a week later, and I said, hey, hey Yong, what happened? And he said, okay, I'll come. And he did that to me again two more times, a total of four times. He said he would come. And he didn't come. But I never gave up. After four times of saying, you want to come to church? He said, no, I got rejected. And about four times he said, I will come. But he didn't come. He stood me up. But I never gave up. And after the fourth time, the fifth time, guess what? He came. He came. And then after that, he came and gone, came and gone, came and gone. But I never gave up on him. Well, eventually, Jung, he got baptized. He became one of my closest friends. He became a Sunday school teacher. He married a wonderful Christian lady. And she is a Sunday school teacher. And they're one of the most humblest, most devoted Christians. You see, there is no such thing as a shortcut when it comes to leading people to the good news of Jesus Christ. Because people that do not know God, people that do not know the love of Jesus Christ, of course, they're not going to, you know, just you know, give their heart, you know, wholeheartedly to something that they don't know? You wouldn't, I would. It's not easy. And at the same time, we have to understand that there's a battle going on. While we and God are trying to, you know, let people know about the love of Jesus Christ, there's Satan that's doing everything that, you know, he can to prevent people from getting to know God. You see, there is no such thing as a shortcut. When it comes to leading people to God, it takes work. It takes patience. And it's not easy. So there is no shortcut. 
And for us to try to find a shortcut to, you know, to leading people to Christ, you know, people often say, you know, let's have an event, and that's good. But ultimately, it is not the event that brings people here. It is relationship. It is people. Oh, let's have some sort of program. Then people will come. Well, people might come because of the program, but they're not going to stay. What makes people stay is the love that we share with them. You see, there is no shortcut. It takes love. It takes sacrifice. It takes service. It takes patience. There is no shortcut when it comes to leading people to the good news of Jesus Christ. Secondly, there is no shortcut in raising our children in God. There is but only one way to raise our children in God. And I talked about this last week too. But there is no easy way out. One of the things that really makes me sad is that too often as parents, we try to find easy way in raising our children. You know, I've been in Korea for three years now, and I, I have to tell you, I love Korea. And uh, not because I was born in Korea. I love Korea because the more I get to know Korea, I enjoy it. I love the life here. I think it's so much more fun than America. I like the, a lot of the culture. I like you know, the, the culture of respect that Korea has. I like the culture of just um, kids, I don't, college students just having fun. Uh, I wish I kind of grew up in Korea uh, when I see all of those things. But there's one thing about Korea that I, I, don't, I do not agree. And there's one thing about Korea that kind of bothers me. And that is the culture of hagwon culture of private institutes, after school classes. Because what I've seen, and because I've been here for three years now, what I've seen is too many parents basically rely on after school programs and institutes to raise their children. What I've seen is from the days of you know, toddlers, parents send the kids to nursery. And as soon as they go to kindergarten, kindergarten age, they send them to kindergarten. And it's not that sending them to kindergarten and nurseries are bad, but eventually what I've seen is that parents not only rely on them to maybe to babysit them or maybe educate them, but they also rely on them to raise them up. They rely on those institutes to entertain the kids. They rely on those kindergarten programs to go on vacations, to treat the kids, something that because parents cannot do because we don't have time. And once they reach elementary and high, junior and high school, we all know this. A child goes to school, you know, 8, eight o'clock in the morning, and after school, and by the time they're finished with all their after school programs and hagwons and institutes, they come home at 9 o'clock and 10 o'clock at night. And in my opinion, what the parents are doing is they're allowing, they're allowing their, the institutes and the after school, after school programs to raise their children. I know that as parents that we're not experts. I know that as parents we, are not, we don't have a lot of time. But too often, I think that we're trying to seek an easy way out. It is the parent's job to raise their children. It is the parent's job to help the children with homework, not pay someone to help our children with homework. It is parent's job to play with our children, not rely on uh, taekwondo places, not rely on kindergartens to you know, play with our children. It is parent's job to teach our children the moral and the value, not allowing after-school programs to teach them these things. But too often I see that parents rely on these things because they want the easy way out. Because it is much more, it is so much easier to pay someone to do those things. I know, as a parent, it is so much, it is so much work, so much work to raise children. Even yesterday, as I shared with you earlier, I had a birthday party. And I cannot really tell you, I'm not here to boast, but I'm just being honest when I say it, it was a lot of work. My wife spent all night Friday night making decorations because she really wanted to make it special for our children. She stayed up late going shopping, getting ready for the food. Saturday morning, the day that I normally spend about three, four hours finishing up my sermon, the morning that I got up, I worked on my sermon for one or, one or two hours, and then I have to spend the next four hours going to Costco, going to Lotte Mart, buying cake, buying pizza, buying games for the kids. And when I came home at one o'clock, I spent the next two hours serving, feeding, listening to the chaos. It was not easy. And then, did the kids go home afterwards? No. About four of them stayed until five o'clock because they wanted to play with Will and Faith. And it was their birthday, so we allowed it to happen. It was hard. 
And I remember one of the parents came to pick up their child, and I was really actually surprised by her statement. She said, when I told her that, she, when she came in, you know, she smiled at me, and I smiled back and I said, wow, this is not as easy as I thought. And she goes, I know. That's why I have never done this for my children, and that's why I will never do this for my children. She said it as a matter of fact, as if there was no big deal. But when I heard that, actually, it really surprised me and shocked me. I know that it's a lot of work. But to be honest with you, even though it's a lot of work, I'm going to do it again for my son and daughter. Because that's what parenting is. I want my children, I want to give my children as good a memory as possible. I want them to grow up having wonderful memories with, you know, having doing things with their mom and dad. I want them to remember their birthday. I remember, I want, I want them when they're like 30, 40 years old. I want them to remember their seven year birthday party. I want them to remember how hard their mom and dad worked. I want them to remember how much their mom and dad loved them and sacrificed for them. But too often, we want to take the easy way out. But in raising children, there is no such thing as an easy way out. Four years ago, I visited a, a, China, a, a city in China called Yanbyan, Yanji. It is a city close to the border of North Korea. And because it's a border town, there are many ethnic Koreans living in that city. In fact, years ago, 45% of the population were ethnic Koreans. People speak Korean there. They have Korean signs everywhere. But when I visited that city four years ago, and I spoke to some of the Christian missionaries that were there, and I was very shocked to what they said. They said, you know, this, uh, the people, the Korean ethnic people living in the city of Yangji, the young people are now just, their lives are destroyed. The young people's lives are being ruined. And I said, how are their lives being ruined? And they, and they said this. Ever since the Korean economy, you know, it just started taking off in the 90s and so forth, you know, more ethnic Koreans have left their children behind and moved to Korea to work and make a living. That is not a bad thing. In fact, I commend them because they're doing it for their family. But what they don't realize is this. This is what the missionary said. See, they have all these college students. They said almost half of the students that study at the university, Korean students that study in Yeonbyon, they said almost half of them do not have their parents living here. Almost half of them grew up without parents because their parents left, left Yanbyon, Yanji, and, and working in Korea. And these Korean parents, they work hard for their children. But the biggest mistake they're making is because they feel so guilty about leaving their children behind, all they do, what they do is send them money. They may not send them a lot of money, but because of the you know, cost of living standard, if you send your children there about two, three hundred dollars, these kids live in luxury. They can buy what they want, they dress what they want, they can spend money however they want. So these parents, because they cannot spend time with them, they give them money. And this missionary said that this money is ruining the lives of these young people. Even in America, all these Korean immigrants who go there, they have to work hard to make a living. They work from morning till night running a small business. And oftentimes these parents, because they so, feel so guilty from working so hard and not spending time with their children, what do they do? They give them money and let them buy what, whatever they want without realizing it is ruining the lives of their children. The point that I'm trying to make is this. There is no shortcut when it comes to raising children. There is no shortcut. It takes time, it takes love, it takes effort, it takes your attention. There is no easy way out. You cannot raise children by spending money. In the end, we will face the consequence of that. There is no shortcut. And we should not look for a shortcut when it comes to raising our children. And lastly, there is no shortcut when it comes to building God's church. The church that I served at for eight years in Houston is actually a very, very famous church among Korean churches. It is known for its cell group ministry, house church ministry, where, without exaggeration, hundreds of pastors come and visit our church to learn about cell group ministry from our senior pastor. Literally thousands of pastors from all over the world have come and gone our church to learn about 
our house church ministry. But here's the thing that kind of bothers me. There are some pastors that go to these conferences. And the reason for them attending these conferences, they want to somehow find out maybe there's a certain program, maybe there's a certain system that can make our church grow. And let me just say that, you know, programs are important. You want to have a good program. You want to have a right system. But sometimes pastors come thinking, maybe if I can just do this program and do this system, it's going to make my church grow. But the thing that they come to learn when they come to our conference is this, that building a church, there is no shortcut. Now, you should have a good system. You should have a good program. But even when you have a good system and a good program, ultimately, you must, you must, there must be sacrifice, hard work. There must be love. There must be serve. There must serve uh, then people must serve one another. They must be passionate. And all of these things, it doesn't matter the system or the program. If you don't have these things, church will not grow. Last week, uh, a church member from that church came to visit me. He was one of the ordained deacons of the church. He came to Dejan and he came to visit us and we had a nice dinner together. And during that dinner time, this deacon, he confided in me. He's one of the uh, top you know, lay leaders of the church. He said, you know, pastor, I have a confession to make. I said, what is it? He said, you know, I was this close to moving to Houston. He said, you know, without telling the senior pastor, we bought a home. We bought an apartment in Seoul because my business mainly is dealing with Korean people. And I would come to Korea like many times throughout the year. And he said, but ultimately the reason why we wanted to move to Korea is that there's just too much church work. He says, Pastor, you know and I know that when I'm in Houston, I spend almost half the time doing church work. And I have so little time in doing my own work. And in a way, in my mind, I kind of wanted to take a break. And I just wanted to get away from church work. And I wanted to come. And I wanted to just kind of rest in Korea. But he said, but he said when he prayed about it, he said his son is a really devoted Christian. He said his son challenged him, Dad, you cannot just make this decision. You have to pray about it. You have to pray about it. You have to pray about it. But finally, he decided to take a few days and pray. he prayed about it. And he said, when he prayed, he says, he just, God really convicted him in his heart that his desire to move was for all the wrong reason. And he realized that as a Christian, that this is part of his calling, not only to work and make money, but to serve God. You know, I've said this many, many times before, but when building God's church, you cannot build God's church by giving your leftover time to God. And to be very honest, it bothers me when people say, when people make excuses, I'm, I'm busy. I'm too busy to serve God. Let me make this very clear. Those people that you know that serve God faithfully, I guarantee you, they serve not because they have a lot of time on their hands. They serve because they make time to serve God. People that save lives by sharing good news of Jesus Christ to others. Again, I guarantee you, they don't do it. They're not doing it because they have a lot of free time. They're doing it because they love God. And they understand that they must make time in order to serve God. Parents that spend time with their children, again, they don't do it because they have time. I know so many parents, they waste their time watching television, playing golf, hanging out with their friends. They have time. They have all the time in the world. But you see people that spend time with their children, they do it because they know that they have to make time. Because they know that there is no shortcut when it comes to leading people to Christ. Because they know that there is no easy way when it comes to raising children. And they do this because they know that there is no shortcut in building God's church. We do not serve God. We do not spend time with our children. We do not share the love of God with others because we have time left over. We do it because we make time. Because in, in, because in life there is nothing more important 
Therefore, we understand that we must make time to do these things. In life, there is no such thing as a shortcut. In building a family, there is no shortcut either. In building God's church, there is no easy way out. When Jesus came to earth, Jesus could have easily said, God, this is too hard. People don't want me to be here. They have rejected that everything that I've said. The physical pain and the suffering is just too much to bear. I just don't have the energy or the desire to do this anymore. Jesus could have easily said those things, but he didn't. Jesus never gave in to the temptation. Because Jesus knew that in leading people to God, in sharing the, with people, when building God's church and sharing the love of God, that there is no shortcut and that there is no easy way out. I pray that that truth is something that we will hide in our hearts that we'll not forget. And I pray that all nations community fellowship, that every member will remember this truth and this church will grow to become the church that God desires because we all understood the simple truth, the simple fact that in life, there is no shortcut. Let us pray.